Now we're going to put together these two concepts we've talked about where we understand that we can find displacement by finding the net area under the curve um, and we can find, um, we understand how this curve is the velocity of a hiker and what the hiker would be doing. So now to find that displacement, we're going to set up the definite integral from 0 to 3 of 3t squared minus 9t plus 6 dt. So this is telling us um, that what we want to do is f approximate, you know, here the velocity is, is maybe this much, and this would give an approximate displacement over that first little bit. And then maybe here we approximate it here, and this gives us an approximate more displacement. And we're going to do this all the way across, picking rectangles, and this would give us a good approximation. And by writing it as a different integral, we're saying what we want to do is take each of these, the number of rectangles that we're looking at here, and we want these rectangles, the number of rectangles, to go to infinity. So we want to get the exact displacement of the hiker from the beginning to the end of the hike. So we're going to set this up as a Riemann sum. So limit of a Riemann sum, limit as n goes to infinity of the sum i goes from 1 to n of f of a plus i delta x times delta x. So in this particular case, we'll be looking at Um, f of our a value is 0, and our delta x is going to be b minus a over n, which is 3 minus 0 over n, so 3 over n. This is 3i over n. And then the delta x up here is 3 over n. So we are looking at the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum, i goes from 1 to n. Now we're going to plug 3i over n in for t. So we get 3, 3i over n squared minus 9 times 3i over n plus 6. And then we put a 3 over n for our delta x. So this is the Riemann sum that we would like to compute. All right, so we can use our sigma notation rules to simplify this. This is going to be the sum i goes from 1 to n of 3 times 3 squared, which is 9 over n squared, times i squared, plus the sum i goes from 1 to n of negative 9 times 3 over n times i plus the sum i goes from 1 to n of 6. And then we have a 3 over n times all that. And so now we can pull those constants out, anything that doesn't depend on i. So we get 27, combining the 3 and the 9, over n squared. The sum i goes from 1 to n of i squared. Plus, well, let's make that a minus because it's a negative 9. So minus 9 times 3 again is 27 over n. The sum i goes from 1 to n of i. Plus the sum i goes from 1 to n of 6. And now we're going to replace those sums with the formulas that we have for them. So we keep the 27 over n squared, and we have a formula for the sum i goes from 1 to n of i squared, and that's n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. And we're going to, oh, we'll wait for another step to do that. 
So minus 27 over n, and now we have a formula for the sum of i, and that is going to be n times n plus 1 over 2. And then we know if we add up 6n different times, we get 6n. And then lastly, we need to distribute this 3 over n through to each term. So this is going to look like the limit as n goes to infinity of 27 times 3 is 81 n squared and cubed, yeah, because we've multiplied that other n in, n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6 minus 81 over n squared, n times n plus 1 over 2 plus 18. All right, so now we're ready to take this limit. And um, we know that when we're taking limits of rational functions, as n goes to infinity, we can look at just the highest power. So if we look at the highest power of n in this first term, we're going to have the 81, and then it's going to be multiplied by this n, and this n, and this 2n. So we're going to get whatever 2 times 81 is, 162 n cubed, divided by, and on the bottom we just have the n cubed and the 6, so 6 n cubed. And then we're going to subtract from that, um, the, we're going to have 81 times n times n for the highest power in that term, so that would be 81 n squared over the 2 n squared that's on the bottom. And lastly, we have 18. So now this is a limit that's easy to do because we can just cancel all these n's and we get 162 over 6 minus 81 over 2 plus 18, which is. So we have uh, 162 divided by 6 is 27. And 81 divided by 2 is 40 and 1 half. And then we have our 18 again. And this comes out to 4 and a half. So if we were measuring that velocity in miles per hour, then the displacement would be that the hiker had gone 4 and a half miles after 3 hours. Now we're going to use a different technique to find the same displacement. We're going to use the fact that we know that if we have a position function, s of t, and we take its derivative, s prime of t, then that gives us our velocity function. So if we start with a velocity function, like 3t squared minus 9t plus 6, and we go backwards, we take the antiderivative of the velocity function, then that ought to give us a position function. So if we take the antiderivative of this particular example, we get t cubed minus 9 halves t squared plus 6t plus c. Now here's the problem. We don't know what that c should be. But maybe we do, because we want to say that the position of the hiker when, we, when they started the hike was at zero. So if we assume that the initial position was a position zero, then we can say that s of zero should equal zero cubed minus nine halves times zero squared plus six times zero plus c, and that should be zero. So then c would be 0, and we could say our position function was t cubed minus 9 halves t squared plus 6t. Now, it doesn't really matter what the initial position was because we're only looking for displacement. We're looking for how much the position changed. So if we want to know how much the position changed from the initial position, which we already said was 0, until after 3 hours, 
So if we put in 3 here, we should get 3 cubed minus 9 halves times 3 squared plus 6 times 3, which is 3 cubed, which is 27 minus 81 halves plus 18. And those numbers should look really familiar. That is what we got at the end of the other way of solving this problem. And it came out to four and a half miles. So notice this was a much easier solution using the fact that we knew the antiderivative of velocity was position and then subtracting the positions because that's what we've done here. Um, we're saying the displacement is the position at time 3 minus the position at time 0, which in our case would be 4 and a half minus 0. So it's important to note we're not just looking at the position at time 3. So that's our displacement. That's a lot easier to do than what we previously did, which was finding the distance traveled using or approximating with rectangles, saying distance traveled is velocity times time that's gone by, and then letting the size of those rectangles go, the, you know, the time that has gone by, letting that amount go to zero as we let the number of rectangles go to infinity, um, which also gave us the exact displacement. And so this leads us to a hypothesis that there is a relationship between antiderivatives and Riemann sums. In particular, limits of Riemann sums, which by which we mean definite integral. And that might have been good in a way by the notation, because we use very similar notation for definite integrals and antiderivatives. But actually, at this point in the course, other than this example, we don't know that there is a relationship there. So you'll have to tune in next time to find out more about that relationship.